Well, good morning. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I am tired. This week has been a week. Uh, I, I was talking with somebody right before the service who said that, that life just keeps happening. <laughs> I go, I feel that. I really do. Um, but you know what? We have a God who understands and cares about all those things. So whether your, your week was a rough one or a great one, we join together to worship the God who rules over all of it. So to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, we open wide the doors of this church with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of sinners. We come to him because he is the, the rock of all eternity that stands firm, and we plant ourselves firmly on him and in his word, because we know that whatever else happens in life, that doesn't change. He doesn't change. And, and his, his care and his concern for us doesn't change. And so we come together and we worship him as those who recognize his unchanging, unfailing love. Uh, as we do that, let's, let's begin with just a brief word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your steadfastness, that you, you just remain the same through all the storms of life, and that you continue to, to guard us and protect us and, and, and care for us. Lord, as we come before you and worship you today, we pray that you would fill us anew with your love and your mercy and your grace, that we would have our strength renewed by you, so that whatever it is that you have for us in life this week, we'll be, we'll be ready uh, because of your power working through us. Not our weakness, but your power. We love you and we, we come to worship you. And so I pray that you would turn our minds and our hearts to you this morning. That we would be able to cast all those cares and concerns at your feet. And, and trust you and praise you for all that you have done and are doing in our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let's stand together this morning. Let's, uh, let's sing praises to the rock of ages. Shall close in death when I saw. 
cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Let's continue our worship with our scripture reading. Um, today's reading will be from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is, he is holy. holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them for the, from the pillar of cloud. They kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. Lord, Lord our, our God, God, you answered, answered them. them. You, you were, were to Israel, Israel a forgiving God. God. Though you punished their misdeeds, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy.
want to see you. Come behold the wondrous mystery. mystery, that you would care and love us as we rebelled against you so much that you would come yourself in flesh, that the infinite would take on a finite body and suffer and die for us, and that death would not be the end but that your victory would be proclaimed in your death and in your resurrection. That's right. Lord, we have hope because you are alive. We thank you. We have life in you because of your life. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. As we turn to your word, we ask that it would be living and active, that it would not return void, but it would be effective in its working, that it would, that it would show us who you are, show us who we are, and that it would work in our lives to shape and mold us more and more into your image. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Unless you're a kid. Uh, kids, thanks for joining us. Uh, you are dismissed to Children's Church. You're always welcome to, to sit and hang out and uh, listen to me if you want. But if you want to go to Children's Church, uh, Miss Lauren actually is really excited about what you guys are going to be talking about today. 
so much that we were talking about she might even do it for more than one week the same thing because it's just so good and I said well I'd almost rather be there than in here but, uh, that's my own burden to bear uh, the, re- the kids though are welcome to go to children's church and uh, either way we're, we're so thankful for our kids and for our kids' ministry and for those who work with them and pour into them and show them who Jesus is. And uh, it's just such a neat part of life in the body together. Uh, for the rest of us, we are continuing a series in the book of Deuteronomy that we're calling The Gospel According to Moses. And we have been looking specifically at the things that Moses has to say about God and his people that ring true even today, in, in, even in a different kind of relationship that we have with God than, than the Israelites did, there are things that are, are the same. And so we're looking for those things and, and pointing them out along the way and, and seeing how even the things that Moses had to say to God's people in the in. Uh, the, on the cusp of entering the promised land, were actually good news things. And that's our focus as we go through. This morning we're in Deuteronomy chapter 19. And we're going to be talking about pursuing justice for the innocent. And if you're innocent, that's a good thing to hear that somebody cares about pursuing justice for you. And, and so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Since about chapter 11, we've been looking at various ways that the relationship between God and his people should make a difference in how they live. How they live in God's presence, because that's part of entering the promised land, is that that this isn't just something for them, but this is where God lives with his people. And so, what does it mean to live in God's presence? But also, how do you live with each other as God's people? There's been this recurring theme of the whole community being included in and cared for by the special relationship between God and his people. And along with receiving the benefits of that relationship, the whole community is also included in bearing responsibility for maintaining that relationship. And so while we have a tendency to think about our relationship with God as, as just an individualistic one-on-one kind of a thing, and, and there's some truth to that. God, we do have that direct access to God, and he does care specifically about us as individuals. There's also here this idea that, that, that being a part of God's people means that you're a part of a group of people, and that, that there's benefits and also responsibilities associated with that, too. Uh, Two weeks ago, in chapter 17, Moses started talking about how the community as a group needed to pursue justice. Specifically, how to maintain the relationship between God and his people by pursuing justice. By making sure that that evil deeds didn't go unpunished. That they didn't get to continue happening. But that they were... um, kind of expunged from the land. That's the idea behind justice in that setting, is that that evil doesn't continue to persist in God's presence among his people, but that it gets dealt with, because that's part of living in community in God's presence, is, is not continuing to overlook evil. And ensuring that the whole community continued to follow the terms of that special relationship agreement with God and his people. Uh, And we'll be referring back to a few of those terms explicitly this week as we look to uh, terminology about judicial justice, particularly about innocent defenders. So we'll be talking about the the classic terms of the agreement that we refer to in in Deuteronomy are the, the ten commandments or the ten words and those will come up in in our journey this morning through Deuteronomy 19 Uh, but but that's sort of the context that's the setting for all of this and so if we if we take just as a couple weeks ago I mentioned this if we take just one or two of these phrases or paragraphs on their own and just pull them into our current context 
we're going to have trouble making that fit with what Moses is actually talking about and what God is communicating to his people through Moses. So it's important that we look at these things in the context of what God was doing with the Israelites as they enter into the land. And then once we understand that, we'll be able to talk more specifically about what does that mean for us today as as mostly non-Israelites who don't live in the land. Are there things that, that are still true for us? And I'd say, yes, there are, but they may not be the ones that you would expect right on the surface. And so we'll, we'll start by digging in deep to the context, and then we'll move to, so, so now what? What does that mean for us? And with all that in mind, let's go now to Deuteronomy 19. Moses says, when the Lord your God has destroyed the nations whose land he's giving you, And when you have driven them out and settled in their towns and houses, then set aside for yourselves three cities in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Determine the distances involved and divide into three parts the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, so that a person who kills someone may flee for refuge to one of these cities." This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety. Anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally, without malice aforethought. For instance, a man may go into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood. And as he swings his axe to fell a tree, the head may fly off and hit his neighbor and kill him. That man may flee to one of these cities and save his life. Otherwise... The avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage, overtake him if the distance is too great, and kill him even though he is not deserving of death, since he did it to his neighbor without malice aforethought. This is why I command you to set aside for yourselves three cities. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he promised on oath to your ancestors and gives you the whole land that he promised them, Because you carefully follow all these laws I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk always in obedience to him, then you are to set aside three more cities. Do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance, and so that you will not be guilty of bloodshed. But if out of hate someone lies in wait, assaults and kills a neighbor, and then flees to one of these cities, the killer shall be sent for by the town elders, be brought back from the city, and be handed over to the avenger of blood to die. Show no pity. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood, so that it may go well with you. Do not move your neighbor's boundary stone set up by your predecessors in the inheritance you receive in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid. And never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity. Life for life. Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. Hand for hand. Foot for foot. This is God's word. As we begin looking at... uh, God's word through Moses this morning, I, I want to talk overall about this concept of pursuing justice for the innocent. I mentioned that already. 
But I, I do want to do it in that context. And so what we're going to start with is with this idea that protecting God's place happens by protecting God's people. Protecting God's place by protecting God's people. That's part of pursuing justice for the innocent. We've referenced a few times, uh, mostly in the last couple months, uh, a relationship triangle. uh, Showing the relationship between God and his people, between God and his place, and between God's people and God's place. And that's part of what's at work in this passage here. Is that the, 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 the part about God's place is almost as important about, as the part about God's people. Over and over again in this passage, Moses makes reference to the place itself, the, having been given that place by God, dividing the place in certain ways, making sure that, that innocent blood isn't shed In that place, in verse 10, he says, Do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. That that the land actually plays a prominent role in this discussion. Because this is God's special place. We've talked in the past about how in describing the promised land, Moses uses a lot of language that, that sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden. And the idea there is that this special land that God is giving to his people is is a lot like the Garden of Eden. It's a special place set aside by God for him to dwell with his people. It's it's, It's representative of a temple, or you could actually go the other direction and say a temple is representative of the Garden of Eden. A lot of temple imagery in in Scripture talks about things like budding flowers. Uh, There's this this idea that those two things are overlapped and interlinked. And so this is God's special place where he's going to live with his people, and that means it needs to be holy and pure. You wouldn't expect to walk into a temple and find it covered in dirt. it's supposed to represent the God that's being worshipped. And so it it needs to be clean. Well, that's the idea in in this section as well, is that, that the evil that is being described can't just continue in God's special place and and have the expectation that both God and his people will continue in this harmonious relationship in that place. And so to, to protect God's place, you need to protect people who are innocent of crimes from being punished for those crimes. That's the logic behind Moses' argument here. There is certainly this ideal of justice that's being upheld, but it's not being upheld for itself. It's being upheld for what that says about God and his place. Just as when we talked about justice a couple chapters ago, we talked about justice isn't an end in and of itself, but it's, it's aimed at that relationship between God and his people and making sure that that is secure. So here, we're making sure that the relationship between the people and the place are secure and that, that God's presence is welcome there. So just as with the temple, there are places of increased holiness. So we still have reference to going to certain places that God sets aside for his people to worship and interact with him in special ways. But but daily life still happens with this idea that, that God's presence is there with his people. And so we need to make sure that we're living in that in that context of of God's presence all around us. That's the driving force behind God's instructions for Israel. It's that they are special people set aside to a special God in a special place. And another word for special in all of those phrases is holy, set apart. That's the idea behind all of this. So justice in this context is driven by a sense that even if other people find success through corruption of justice, you can point to examples in Egypt and and 
all the surrounding nations of, well, this is how this works over here. Such an approach will not stand in God's special place. That's, that's the idea behind all of this. Before I move too far forward, I, I want to address that concept. We might not have a land grant as God's people today. We're not Israel. We don't have a special land given to us. Um, but we have been given much. That's the refrain through this passage is, the Lord's going to give it to you when the Lord has given it to you, when you receive this from the Lord. That's what Moses says over and over in, in not just this chapter, but all of Deuteronomy. And we too have been given much as God's people. We've been given forgiveness. We've been given restored relationship with God. The presence of God dwells in us and among us and it guides us and it directs us and, and shapes our lives. Right, The Holy Spirit moves in our hearts and, and, and shapes and molds us and directs us. That's, that's special. That's holy. And, and the New Testament doesn't let us off of the holiness hook as God's people just because we live outside of the promised land given to Israel. We're to be holy because God is holy. We're to pursue lives that fit with God's character because we are one with Christ. We've been joined with Him so we, we don't take Him into unholy situations. We've been freed from bondage to sin so that we have the freedom to pursue obedience. That doesn't mean that our relationship with Him is contingent on our success in obe obeying Him. That's not what I'm saying. It, it just means that because of how he's, he's brought us into that relationship with Him, we respond by obeying. By trying to, to live as he would have us to live. That's, that's our response. It's not the, the, the foundation. It's not the terms of entering into that relationship. But it's, it's how we maintain that relationship. It's how we keep it going. It's how we stay connected to God. So while it remains true that there's a distinction between how Israel was to pursue justice and how civil justice functions in our world and our society today, we're no less interested in seeing truth prevail and evil punished than Moses was as he instructed Israel. We as God's people value the truth and we value holiness and we value Justice and making sure that whether that's, that's in punishment or in acquittal, that what is right is what is done. That's, that's our foundation for what follows. So we started with that idea that protecting God's place is, is done by protecting God's people. But then we move forward and see that trust that, that, that um, pursuing justice for the innocent involves trusting the process in the midst of grief. The, the concept behind these cities of refuge that Moses describes might be foreign to us. We don't have something like that in our society today where you can run to a specific city to, to, to be safe from persecution for murder. That, that's a foreign concept for us. I, I understand that. But what lies behind that concept shows that God knows and understands people so well. He recognizes that when somebody dies, there's going to be a strong and urgent desire to avenge their death. And he doesn't condemn that strong, urgent desire he recognizes that that's a terrible, awful thing and that there should be response associated with that, especially among the family members. So he doesn't 
condemn this concept of an avenger who, who goes out seeking the person responsible. He also recognizes that sometimes that vengeance is inappropriate. That, so he establishes this system as a form of what we might consider today the concept of being innocent until you're proven guilty. That, that rather than getting to just decide this person did it so they're going to die, there's a, there's a process. The person flees to the, the place set aside for such a process and then seeks the process. An investigation happens. They determine what went, went down and, and whether or not there was malicious intent behind it. And a verdict is reached. And, and that is hard for family members to endure. But it's also hard for somebody who is innocent to, to have to wait through and find out, am I, gonna, am I going to be protected or not? That both of those things are true. And so God establishes this system for his people because he's concerned with making sure that innocent people aren't punished for crimes they didn't commit. And that's a, that's a concern that everybody really should have anyway. Is that you don't want to punish people who didn't actually commit a crime just because you feel upset about the, whatever it is that happened. you you got to... Make sure that you're positive about what happened before punishment is given. And, and he does that in a way that fits within the, the cultural and practical context of ancient Israel. And then, and then he does that in a way that even reflects the changing nature of what's happening with them as a community. They're going in to, to, to possess a new land... And it's going to happen in stages. And earlier Moses said that that's going to happen in stages because if they were to drive out all the people all at once, the wild animals would just take over the whole land because they wouldn't be able to fill it fast enough to actually maintain things. And so it's going to take some time for them to to actually receive all the land. And so he says, start out with three cities based on what you get right away and divide the land equally so that... There's, there's time, there's, there's um, an ability for the person to get there in time. And then when you get more land, you're going to need to set aside more cities. Um, a couple things that, that I, I just came to mind as I was thinking about this concept uh, are fairly trivial. So if, if you're already on edge because you are, are remembering a a situation where you were waiting for justice and that was really hard. I'm, I'm sorry if this is trivializing it. That's not my intent. But it's just to get in our heads something more concrete about what's happening in this passage. Uh, one of them is just a children's game, tag. I know that's not nearly as serious as somebody being chased down because somebody thinks they murdered somebody. But tag involves chasing and running. And at some point, all kids recognize they can't run forever. Parents don't think that that's true. Parents think kids seem like they will never run out of energy. But kids recognize they need to take a break and breathe every now and then. So when kids play tag, they have a special provision for when they need to take a break. And they have different words for it. Base. Home base. The safety spot. There's all kinds of terms, but the the concept is always there. When when we're in this place, when we touch this thing, when we... And sometimes, the longer they play, the more spaces get established. Because they get tired. They need more breaks. And so they say, okay, we're going to start out with... uh, You know, the whole room is, 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 is danger except for the stage. Well, then eventually they go, okay, the stage is safe, but also the sound booth area is safe because it's a long room and we need space on the other side of the room too. And they expand those spaces that are safe because they recognize that if they don't, they're going to get caught. They're going to get tagged. And so they want more opportunities to stop and rest. And that's similar 
to this concept, is that, that there's a need for safety. There's also a recognized need for a family member to pursue what in their mind is justice. And putting those things together and saying, we need spaces that are safe so that everybody can calm down, take a breath, and, and, and wait until we know more. Pursue the process. Um, we don't often value in our society the concept of a family member taking justice into their own hands. Because we've come up with a, a much more detailed process. We're, we're not looking for safe spaces, we're looking for safe structures. I, I understand that. But we also do generally understand the concept of people wanting vengeance for, for, for death. Uh, I, I referenced a, a very old movie that... Um, some people know and some people don't. If you don't know it, don't worry about it. But I said, it's, it's like, um, it, there's a movie called The Princess Bride. And there's a character whose whole, his whole life is this, is pursuing the man who killed his father. And he has a statement prepared. He spent decades chasing this man who killed his father. And he says, when I see him, I'm going to introduce myself. Say Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. That, that's his whole character. And, and, and they're, this is an old enough movie, this shouldn't be a spoiler for anyone. If you haven't seen it, that's on you. <laughs> the end of the movie, he, he gets his, his vengeance and then says, now what? I don't have a plan. Because that was all that mattered to him. And that's a, there's some humor in that character. It's a funny movie in a lot of ways. There's a lot of humor around it. But there's a sympathy there too. Where you understand this has changed his whole life. As a young man, he saw his father killed. And he saw who did it. And so his whole life is focused on seeing that wrong righted in some way. There's sympathy there. And it took a long time, decades, for him to see that handled. But there's also a sense in which you, you don't want to see that done in such a way that it creates more problems. So God is concerned that innocent blood is not shed in the land. That works on both sides of this equation. That you don't want somebody to be murdered, but you also don't want somebody to be punished with the death sentence who doesn't deserve it. And so you need to work these things out together. One of the hardest things for aggrieved people to endure is a lengthy process waiting to see justice satisfied. The cry of God's people throughout the ages has been, How long, O Lord? How long must we wait to see evil punished? We know that one day Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. That everyone will be judged by the one who knows all things, who sees all things, who himself is the definition of truth and righteousness and justice. And we also have roles to play here and now in pursuing justice. And so we join with Christ as his people in seeing justice done as he gives us the responsibility and the opportunity to do so. But even as we wait to see him finally and ultimately deal with evil, we remember that God's patience is not a stamp of approval for evil. There are so many passages we could go to, but I want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 
Because I think this is the part that's the hardest thing for us to remember. When, when we feel wronged or we feel that someone we care about has been wronged. Second Peter chapter 3. And I'm actually going to start earlier than I planned. Because there's just so much goodness here. I'm going to start in verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That as we wait, we don't wait as those who don't have hope. That as we long to see evil punished, we do so as those who even more than that long to see those who have committed evil repent of their evil. To turn from their wicked ways and to follow the God of righteousness and justice. We long to see their lives redeemed by the blood of Christ. That's hard. But that's what God's word continually points his people to. Is this idea of the, the balance between seeing people punished for evil... And seeing people reconciled to God and to relationship with his people. That's a hard thing to balance. And, and as, we, as we recognize that difficulty, we move through the passage into our, our final point of what it looks like to pursue justice for the innocent. Is that is by value, that is valuing life happens by seeking truth. That it's hard to wait to see justice accomplished, but, but if we jump to the end, often we miss the truth. And if we value life, we have to seek truth. Having established systems for ensuring that those who do evil things will be punished, Moses turns his attention to those who would use the system as weapons against their neighbors. That they'd find the loophole and use that to their advantage. Moving stones, bearing false witness, might seem really different. But they're both associated with the systems used to establish what is right... And what is wrong? And so he starts by talking about moving your neighbor's boundary stone. It's almost like a, a bait and switch for those who are, are tempted to do the false witness thing. Because it's a smaller thing. Oh, I'm just going to move that, that little marker over here a little bit. Well, that's actively trying to pervert justice... 
in a way that harms your neighbor and benefits you. That's, that's the idea here. It's also set in the context of this inheritance that you receive in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. That, that these lines have been marked out to make sure that everyone's taken care of. And so if you're moving those lines, it's because you don't feel like God is actually taking care of you as well as he should. That it's not just a disagreement between you and your neighbor, it's a disagreement between you and God. Saying, I don't think you're taking care of me as well as you should, so I'm going to take what I think should be mine. That's, that's what's behind this. And then he moves into, and oh, by the way, if, if you're going to bear false witness against your neighbor, don't think you can just get away with that. So here's how to make sure that, that people are actually stating the truth when they bring up accusations against their neighbors. It's that, first of all, you can't just make something up on your own, make an accusation, and expect that it will be received and dealt with without any investigation. There needs to be a, a, a few people to co corroborate what actually happened. And, and then, if there's malicious intent behind the testimony of a witness, there's a process. And that process sounds a lot like what happens in the convoluted cases that we saw in chapter uh, 17. Where he says, if it's too complicated for you to sort out yourselves, bring the whole thing to the place God sets aside, to where his priests and judges are serving... And you go there, and, and they'll inquire of the Lord, and he'll give them an answer, and then they deliver it to the people. Well, that's, that's what's described here, is they stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who were in office at that time. And then the judges make an investigation, and if, if the witness proves to be a liar, and that would be the word of the Lord delivered to the priests and judges who then deliver it to the people, God says, nope. You were lying, and you were doing that with malicious intent against your neighbor. The punishment is going to fit the punishment you sought for your neighbor. So if you're seeking to have something taken away from them, it'll be taken away from you. And then that's where the, the, this line in verse 21 comes from. Show no pity. Life for life. If you were seeking the death penalty for your neighbor... That's, that's going to be your penalty. If you were seeking that their eye be gouged out, we're going to gouge out your eye. That their tooth be pulled, we'll pull your tooth. That their hand be cut off, that their foot be cut off. The point is not the details of the punishment. It's that it's like punishment for like offense. Right? That, that if you wanted them to serve 10 years in prison, you serve 10 years in prison. That if you were making this up to harm them, what harm you were going to do to them is what will be done to you. The, the purpose, again, in verse 20, is similar to some of these other dramatic things that we've heard in the law already. It says, the rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. It's intended to prevent that from being commonplace. You don't want a situation where everybody says, that's the loophole. We found it. We're all going to go through that process to get evil things done to our neighbors. When I don't like that person, I can just bring up an accusation and and they can be punished even though they, they didn't do it. That, that God says, no, no, no. That's not how justice works. That's not what this system is about. It's not a system for you to use and abuse for your own evil purposes. It's a system to ensure that God's holiness, that God's people's holiness, that God's place's holiness is protected. That's the purpose of the justice system in Israel, is to protect the holiness of that whole relational triangle and keep it intact. And so this 
thing about the boundary stones and this thing about the witnesses is about guarding those relationships and keeping them intact. I mentioned that we'd refer back to the ten words in this, in this passage. Well, moving the stones fits with don't covet. Don't desire what your neighbor has. Don't take his stuff. And then bearing false witness is straight from the ten words. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. These are the terms of the agreement between God and his people. That they said, yes, we will live in this way. And and you'll be our God. And we'll be your people. And this is great. We're so excited about that. Well, Moses is saying, "Don't, don't break the terms of the agreement. Keep it intact for all God's people. Each point, um, yeah, so this process that's described, I mentioned, links back to chapter 17 and, and focuses their whole justice system on that idea that it's not about structures and authorities as much as it is about their special relationship with God. And so... Instead of saying, well, we need some really smart people to do the investigation, they go before God. And God is the one who says, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, and this is what you do about it. Their situation, their their reason for doing things the way they did it was different than what we have and see today. So that's that's a starting point for us when we consider what does this look like for us? We don't have the ability to do the things that are being described here or even the same reasons for it. But that doesn't mean that this concept of pursuing justice for the innocent should be completely discarded by God's people today. Um, One thing that I think should help point us in that direction, and maybe it won't, maybe it'll be distraction, but but this is where I'd like to head, is in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually quotes the last verse of of Deuteronomy 19. So I'd like to go there to finish our time in the Word this morning. Matthew chapter 5. A lot of people know Matthew chapter 5 because it begins with what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. That's what we we know Matthew 5 for. But, But he begins with the Beatitudes. He sets up, this is what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. And then he starts describing it with very specific applications. He talks about them being salt and light. The light of the world. He talks about how he's come to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He talks about murder and says, yeah, you know, it is bad to murder. You know that. But I'm telling you, it's not just bad to murder. It's actually bad to hate. And so if you've harbored hate and anger in your heart, You've essentially committed murder. And then he says, adultery is really bad. That's what the law says. But I'm telling you, if you've even thought about it, you've done it. That he's setting a higher standard. That it's not just about the external deeds, but about the heart. And then he comes to this phrase, you've heard it said in verse 38. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
He causes His sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That here he's, he's continuing to uphold the, the righteous requirements of God's law for his people, but then he's going beyond the surface to the heart and saying, look, yeah, you, you would have a right to punish somebody in the way that they have done the wrong against you. But which is more important? To, uphold, to hold on to that right? Or to forgive freely as you've been forgiven freely? There's, there's a point where we say it's important to see justice done, but there's also a point where we say we're willing to give that over to God. And let him be the one who decides how that works itself out. Jesus is not saying evil should go unpunished. The rest of his sermon here makes that clear. But he's aiming at our hearts and at our desire to get back at people for hurting us. That goes back to the avenger of blood for the family who wants to get back at the person for hurting the family. He sees another layer of abuse in the system. So Moses saw the, the layers there and gave, gave restrictions and said, Hey, no, we got we to gotta rein this in a little bit. And then people said, Okay, so Moses closed those loop, loop, loopholes. Maybe there's another one over here. And Jesus says, Stop looking for the loopholes to harm your neighbor. He finds that other layer of abuse in the system and he directs us towards seeking the good of all, even those who would harm us, and seeking their restoration to fellowship with God and with his people, which is what, I, what we said a couple weeks ago was the whole point of that justice system in Israel, is that it's all about seeking the restoration of people to God. That's, that's our focus. And so there are points where that involves punishment and we should seek that out. But there are also points where if we're wise and discerning, we'll see that actually what will achieve that end goal more than the punishment is forgiveness and grace and mercy. We've all been shown grace upon grace. And so as we find ourselves wronged, or we find ourselves concerned about someone else who has been wronged, we seek both that wrongs will be righted, but also the restoration of people on both sides of the issue to fellowship with God and with God's people. That's, that's what it looks like for God's people to pursue justice for the innocent is to pursue it all the way through to its end. That its end is not just punishment or not punishment, that its end is pointing everybody to who God is, to His standard for living, and to, to pointing everybody into obedience to Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You for who you are. That you are the God who is right. That you are the God who knows, who sees, who oversees. We thank you that, that you are the one who will make all the wrong things right. Lord, as we wait for that day when you will make all things new, we also groan and, and long for justice in, in our own lives and in our own places. 
Lord, we pray that you would be at work in and through us to see justice done in in the right way that's pleasing to you, that, that sees people pointed to you, that sees life restored. Lord, we pray that you'd be active in us and in our lives to comfort those who grieve, to punish where punishment is needed, to seek restoration where it is lacking. Lord, you are the God who reigns over all. And sometimes it's hard for us to let go where we think we should reign, where we should rule. Lord, I pray that you would reign and rule in our hearts and in our lives, that all that we say and all that we do would be glorifying to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and uh, sing this final song together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all Lord of all, all our hope, all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory to you, God, the light of the world, Jesus beside. above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin.
Please be seated. Uh, we have changed some things up in our order of things, so if it's been a few weeks for you, ha ha, we're not done yet. Uh, the announcements come at the end now. And this time's a little longer on purpose, so hang in there, please. Uh, we have a lot going on that I want to draw attention to today. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to everybody who came yesterday for work day. It was a lot of work and a lot of good things were done, and thank you for all of your help. Um, yeah, can we clap for them? That'd be great. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot uh, last week, actually, in, in the scripture passage about how valuable it is, uh, the work that people do for God's people and his kingdom, and, and that's part of what happened yesterday. So thank you again to all of you who were part of that. Uh, we have a ton of stuff. We have packed the end of August with all the things that we haven't done in forever. So I'm going to suggest you look at your bulletins, but I'm going to highlight a few things quickly. Uh, one that's not in your bulletin is that next week um, we have a special person joining us. So most of you know that we sent a team to Albania this summer, and they just came back, and we're, we're still uh, helping them recover, so we haven't asked them to, to get up and say or do things, but uh, one of the people that they worked with, with crew in Albania, is actually going to be here next Sunday, and her name's Anita, her picture's been out in the foyer for months now. Uh, and we'll get to meet her and hear from her about the ministry that God has been doing and, and that she expects he'll be doing in, in and through her as she works with crew in Albania. And then maybe some connections to our team. So that's really exciting and special. And I just want to put that on your radar for next week. Um, then the end of the, the very end of the month is, is, is all the things at once. So we have a beach night on August 26th. We have the part two of our annual meeting on the 28th. That's in two weeks. We have our halftime kickoff on August 31st. Uh, we're just doing it all at once. So uh, I just encourage you to, to keep tabs on that. Mark your calendars for those things. Uh, we really want to to get things kicked off for the fall in a good way altogether. So part of that is I've been having different ministry leaders come up. We started with Brad last week. He made an announcement about Awana and about ways that people can help. Uh, we have a new ministry lead that I want to bring up this week. So Ben, come on up. Uh, I, yep. Yeah, um, I, when I got here actually, uh, not right when I got here because Tyler was here for a bit, after Tyler left, I talked with the elders some about our structure and one of the things I said is instead of finding just a new youth pastor, we should be looking for an associate pastor. We really could use two pastors at this church. And part of that is because, uh, one, especially, that became even more entrenched in my mind once they decided that they wanted me to be the next senior pastor. Because I've never been a senior pastor before. And, and that old structure was one meant for somebody who was a senior pastor, who was seasoned, and who could mentor the persons under him. So Dave did that really well with Ben Sobels and with Grant Combs. That was, and those guys are now senior pastors at other churches in our community. It's really incredible. I'm not Dave Hong. Uh, I don't know if you figured that out yet or not, but I'm not him. I needed somebody who could be a, a peer to come alongside me and work together to do the ministry of the church together. And somehow or another, Ben kind of, fell into our laps. I mean, we didn't do a long, lengthy search to, and, and comb through hundreds of people. Uh, ben became the person without us even having to look. And, and I don't know how to describe that in a way in front of everybody that's helpful, but it's really just the work of God. That's the only way I can describe it, is that 
God brought us the right person at the right time, and I'm incredibly thankful. And so Ben Bransford has, has started as our associate pastor. He started on Monday, and this is his first Sunday with us. Ben, who are you? Where did you come from? <laughs> Where did I come from? Um, <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm a, okay, how about this? I'll say this. If you want my full testimony, you take me out for coffee and dinner. How about that? And I'll give you the Amen. full story. Um, but yeah, really quick, uh, I, was, I was born in Southern California. We moved here when I was in kindergarten. So I actually grew up here. I uh, went through all the Carmel School, uh, school District and uh, eventually went off to college. And I think we're going to get to that question in a second. But didn't think I was going to end up back on the peninsula, but God did bring me back. Um, and yeah, so I don't know what else. Whatever you want, I? man. Um, I love sports. I like, yeah. you'll see that all over the walls of my new office. So you're a big Giants fan, I take it? No, 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 no. No, I'm not a Dodgers <laughs> fan either, so but no, I'm, a, I'm an Angels fan, unfortunately. So it's been a, uh, so was Grant. So that, that's why we got along so well back in yeah. when he was here. <laughs> um, so you alluded to this. Why, why would you want to pursue pastoral ministry? Uh, people who don't know this, may not realize it's it's hard work ben why why would you want to why would you want to be a pastor yeah so that's it's that's probably the longest part of my testimony it's probably happened in the last year total um i had no intention of becoming a pastor ever actually um i uh, th- i studied business in college uh minored in finance entrepreneurship and stuff like that. I own my own business out of, out of college, worked in the sports industry for a while, um, then in music, and had a great time doing it. Our team was good at it. Uh, we were doing really well. COVID kind of threw a wrench into that stuff. But uh, other than that, I, I, I had really no intention of going into ministry as a vocation. I was always super involved with my church. Um, I think I did the math the other day. It's been about seven years of being kind of in and off of staff and volunteer roles and then 14 years in the church. So it's been a while, but um, I would say over the last year or so, God really got a hold of my heart. Um, I did a lot of studying and praying and reading uh, the testimonies of pastors from, let's call them the old dead guys. And I think he just really opened my heart to say, this, this is something I might be calling you to. And it started out as a might and then it became increasingly clear that it was a, I'm calling you to this. And I want to say that the call actually started a lot earlier than I wanted to admit. And I really pushed that down. Um, because I was in other, again, other businesses. I'd spent my life doing something else, put a lot of money and time and energy into other things. And I think when I, I there, was a, there was a point, I don't know if it was a day or time, but there was a point to where I knew I couldn't suppress it anymore. And, I, and it was a good thing. It was, it was a relieving thing. It was a freeing thing. So I think Charles Spurgeon said it best. He says, if you can do anything but be a pastor, do it. Um, amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I've, I've had opportunities to preach and teach and disciple. And um, I, I seriously can't think of anything I'd rather do with my life and my job. So, yeah. 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 Um, I, I just feel the need to, to throw this in here, too. This is, this is hard, but it's also a joy. There's this, this weird thing. I, I don't know why God designed it this way, but shepherding people is, is both difficult and inc- incredibly rewarding. So it's not that, that we would say it, uh, it's only hard, but it is hard. There, a lot of the hardship comes from seeing the slowness with which God works to change people and not being able to just change them ourselves. And that's, that's just a, a piece. So, so please don't hear us up here saying it, we don't like being involved in ministry. We, we love it. It's just, it's, it, truly, if you can do anything else with your life, it will be uh, in some ways easier for you. Than, than shepherding God's people. It just is. It's, uh, and we're not the first to say that. There's a long line of people in ministry who've said, hey, this is a special thing that uh, God requires a lot of the people that he uses to pastor people. And it, what he requires is our whole lives. <laughs> uh, and, and that's not 
that we don't give those freely. It's that it, it, it is a big thing that we give. Um, this church has been, in the short time that I've been here, incredibly supportive to me and to other people on staff and in ministry. Uh, and so I know that one of the questions a lot of people are going to have, if they haven't had it already, is how can they help and support you as you come on board? What are some specific ways that we can encourage you, come alongside you, and, and just help you integrate well into our body? Yeah, I mean, I, I've only four days here, so I'm still getting to know a lot of people and kind of get to know the, the history of how things have been done and, um, and that. So I think I plan first and foremost to do a lot of listening, uh, a lot of meeting, a lot of, a lot of um, hearing you guys out on, on where things have been, where you, your ideas of where things should go. Um, I, I certainly have my ideas, but um, I don't want to be a bull in a china shop here and just kind of upset the apple cart. But um, Thank you, Ben. I appreciate yeah. that a lot. <laughs> Direct your emails to him, by the way, if that happens. Um, <laughs> I would. I, th I don't think. I don't think you're going to like my answer as much as I. I, I would love numbers. I'd love help. Youth ministry is going to be starting on the 31st. Um, so obviously, there's going to be a need for bodies and volunteers and stuff for, for the things that I have kind of in mind. I would say first and foremost, I would ask for your patience. And probably, well, not probably, prayer. <laughs> um, uh, I'm new. This is my first ever uh, job in full-time vocational ministry. Um, I have expectations for myself. Um, I'm sure you guys have expectations for me as well. Um, I'm, I don't promise to be perfect. Um, I'm going to screw up. I'm going to say some stuff that probably rubs some people the wrong way. Uh, I'm probably going to not handle stuff exactly how I should probably handle stuff. But um, as we just heard, that's kind of the God we serve, right, is that grace and mercy um, and patience. So I would say first and foremost, patience, definitely prayer. Um, and my door's open, so stop on by. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear the history of you guys have been to this church and uh, kind of move forward. And yes, the specifics will come of what we need ministry-wise, but I think relationally that's what I'd love in the first couple weeks and months. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray for you right now, Ben. Lord, I thank you for... And I thank you for the work that you've done in his life to, to bring him to that place where he recognizes your call to, to minister to your people. Lord, I thank you for bringing him to us and for the, just the incredible way that you made that happen. And um, I, I pray that as we receive him, that we would recognize the gift that you're giving to us and that we would, would um, steward well. Ben, his life, his time, his gifts and abilities. Lord, I pray that you would continue to grow him as a man of God and as your servant. That as he becomes more and more Christ-like, that that would be something that rubs off on the rest of us. That as we see you working in his life, it prompts us to follow you as, as he's following you. Lord, I pray that you would give him wisdom and grace, patience, that you give him endurance. Lord, I pray that you would give us the, the ability to see what you're doing in and through Ben, to see his needs, to see where we can come alongside and be a part of what you're doing in his life. Lord, I pray that you would be at work through... Uh, this yet another change in the life of our church, that you'd be at work for your good and for your glory and for the strengthening of your people. Lord, I pray that you would work in and through uh, the ministry that you've called Ben to do, uh, for the discipleship of others, for, for reaching people who don't yet know you, for the expansion of your kingdom, for your glory. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One final, yeah, I'll take that. Thanks. Uh, one final thing, and I promise then we'll let you go. If you are visiting, welcome. We're so glad you're here. 
a special welcome to you. We are going to have a time outside where we have coffee and bagels and there's usually fruit if you don't want bagels, if you're anti-carb, whatever. We have some light refreshments. We'd love to get to know you and for you to get to know us. If you're shy, or even if you're not shy, but you just want to pass on this information anyway, we have these nice little cards. We'd love for you to fill one out and tell us who you are so that we can reach out and get to know you better, and you can ask any questions you have of us. And you can put those cards in a little box that's in the foyer that has the word offering plastered on the front of it. And that's a reminder for the rest of us that there's a box in the foyer for offerings. Uh, as we go... Uh, I want to pronounce a benediction from the book of Numbers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.